On this special episode of the Traversing Stars podcast, we have returning champion William Sadler. We discuss his upcoming movie, Salem's Lot, and his career as a music performer. Now join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Mr. Sadler. Thank you so much for coming back to the Traversing the Stars podcast. You're one of my favorite actors to talk with. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's 100% my pleasure. So, well... um, as I'm doing some research about you, I always go through IDM Pro to find out about the actor. Have you done a lot of um, horror movies? Last time you were here, we talked about The Unholy. So right. Do you have a particular affinity for horror movies or acting in horror movies? And what draws you to the genre? I think I don't. I don't know. They're, horror horror movies are fun. They're they're always fun. I mm-hmm. mean, they're people in the most extreme situations, um, like in The Mist. You know, you're all locked in a in a grocery store with monsters outside or yeah um there's something very basic about you know it's uh i think it's in everyone's childhood the the creature in the closet or under the bed or mm. you know and it's fun to it, it it they're they're fun to act in they they're you know they're uh, i treat them exactly the way i would treat just just about any acting uh, challenge because um, I'm of the opinion that if I can get people to believe the character, I mean, that's, that's really the only part that I have control over. But if I can get people to believe just a little bit in the, my character and what he's going through, what he's actually feeling mm. and doing, then they will come along for the ride. They'll, mm. you know, then you can, you can take them to, you know, another galaxy. You can, you can pretend that there are creatures outside the grocery store that are trying to eat us. Um, all of that stuff is hard to buy unless there's a, at, at least some, something at the center of the story that the audience looks at and says, mm. oh, no, well, that's true. You know, that feels, that feels real. Mm. And I'm, I, I guess I sort of feel like that's my job. But one thing I find that's kind of fun is that um, having spoken to you and actually, and I follow you on social media, you're one of the nicest guys, you know, in, in, in you're, it doesn't seem fake with you. You seem like one of the nicest guys there is. So when you play villains, it's, it's kind of like, where the hell is that coming from? Like, how is this one looks at you and goes, that's an awesome villain. When I think to myself, I look at you and goes, awesome. he's too nice to be a villain. <laughs> I know, I know. No, that that just sort of happened to me with uh, when I got to Los Angeles when I started doing movies. They, the very, I mean, I think the very first big movie I did was Project X, where I was the scientist who killed all the chimps. You know, radiate, teach them to fly, and then put them in flight simulators, and then radiate them so that they die. <laughs> um, I was like, but. but um, I I don't know. I think it's it's again. It's good to put good actors in those kind of roles mm-hmm. because then the threat to the hero is feels real. Mm. It's the reason I think why you see you know like Anthony Hopkins, um, you know, in Silence of the Lamb. The only reason you really you know you're scared shitless about what's going to happen to Clarice. Is because he's so he's so good mm. and so believable, and so I, you know, like I said, I think that's I, I think that's my job. Um, you can't have a good James Bond unless you've got a a really good Doctor No. Mm. You know I what agree. I mean? One hundred percent. I mean, you get, it's otherwise who's you know what's what's the big deal? He's um, he's the, the the villains have got to be. Uh, a real sinister threat yeah. if the hero is going to be a hero of any you know of any kind so yeah i agree i'm yeah. like uh heath ledger i don't know why i get to play bad guys uh, but, but i take it as a compliment so now i feel like sometimes um when you look at even though they're not the be all end all um like award shows they're talking about like actors um usually it's the drama that gets the respect 
comedies and horror tend not to be viewed at that level. Do you think they're underappreciated or the acting involved necessary to be in these movies are underappreciated? Yeah, I do. I think they I think they should be looked at in the same, you know, with I think they should be given the same weight. If you think, you know, it's wonderful to, you know, it the acting is so wonderful in these dramas. Try doing a comedy, mm. you know? <laughs> Act. It's like who I forget who said it. Dying's not hard. <laughs> acting, a comedy is hard. You know, make yeah. pull, pull off some pull off a really a really funny uh, character or funny scenes. Mm. That's uh, it's totally underappreciated. The, hey. the the chops involved, the people that can do that. Mm. You know? And you know, and I agree. I think because I think with the difference between horror and let's say a drama, a lot of these dramas are i'm not saying not real world but they deal with actual regular emotion that we all can kind of empathy empathize with us we've been in those situations horror is something different it's the same with comedy you're trying to get people to buy into something that's totally outside the realm of our experience and believe right. it a hundred percent as being real and scary even though we're not there to me that's a way that's a far harder uh thing to pull up <laughs> as an actor <laughs> I think so. I think so. I don't, yeah, I don't, and like I said, I don't approach them differently, really. Um, I did a lot of, I did a lot of theater before I started doing films and, this, and um, you know, yeah, yeah, I don't approach them. I don't really approach them differently. They should, they should be treated the same, uh, even though, even though the, where we're taking the audience is different. Mm. It's um, the job is still to get them to buy into it so that you can take them there. Mm. And, uh, and in some ways it's harder to get them to buy into. Uh, oh, he's becoming a vampire. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I completely agree with you. When you're on the set of horror movies, um, and like I said, you've had a, such a tremendously long career. Does it sometimes, I'm not going to say any Pacific movie, so you don't have to name names or anything like that. Does it feel like sometimes yeah. those involved are not approaching it the same way as they would another movie? I know, like I said, you do. Do you feel like sometimes the others involved may not in some movies? Don't say anything Pacific. No, right? I don't. No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I'm, not that I'm aware of. I, um, no, I think people that, people that make horror movies, like, I mean, like the like the the mist, for example. Um, Frank Darabont bought into it completely. You know, um, everyone in the cast, you 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 give it a hundred and ten percent because that's the job, mm. you know. And that's that's the and that's I think the difference between a, you know a, a well done. A, horror film and a, it has a, it at least has a chance to move people to to yeah. engage the, engage the audience and become you know all that it can be if you don't you know i've what you've watched we've all watched films yes. where there's something about uh and hollywood does this hollywood does this all the time where they'll cast people based on um their popularity you know, based on how many followers they have on Twitter or something, yes. um, and uh, rather than rather than the acting chops, yeah, the actual the their actual acting skills, and you can, you know, we've all watched movies where they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on the film, and there's something right at the center of the scene that you're not quite you're not quite buying. You know, you're like. You sit there going, I don't know why. I don't, why don't I care about these people? Yeah. I mean, I don't. Uh, which is, you know, it's a it's a common it's a common mistake. It's very easy. I shouldn't say it's easy, but but you know, you put together the elements. This is a, this is a huge director, and this is an enormous budget, and that's a great set, and this is we're paying millions and millions of dollars for this cast. Um, it's like if you assemble the pieces, there's there's still no guarantee. There's no guarantee at all mm. that the finished product is going to move anyone. 
is going to have the chemistry required to capture people's imagination and and you know make them go and see it again and again um anyway that's that's yeah. my opinion and i'm sticking to it no i agree with you 100 i mean once again, I'm not going to name names of anyone just in case I ever talk to those people. But, right. for, but every so often, you know, I, I know several major movies and, you know, beautiful movies to look at, yeah. cinema, but right at the heart, they chose an actor and you're just like, you know, the problem right. is I can tell that he is performing the role. But while other actors, like when you're in a role, I feel like you're in the role. Like, like I don't think about you as an acting. Like when you played um, the Reaper in Bill and Ted, um, Bone Insurance, I just buy the character. I just accept it because I buy right. into you. But sometimes you watch a movie, you're like, I can tell he's an actor in a movie. I think I think that's well. Th that's a that's another way of saying exactly say exactly the what we're talking about. That if you can if you can buy if you can believe that character. And forget for a minute that you're watching, you know, an actor and the cameras and the script and all the rest of the fake stuff. Um, if you can buy into it a little bit, you, you we can take you. We can take mm. you anywhere. You know, we can make you laugh. We can make we can break your heart. We can. Yeah. Um, but if you don't buy into it, if for some if if there's something in the on the screen. That's making you go, yeah, I don't know. It's a good movie. I, yeah, it's a good movie. You know, if something, and you can, and often you can't quite put your finger on what it is that's the matter. Yeah. That, you know, what's, <laughs> why, why am I not digging this? Um, um, and that's usually, it usually has to do with the acting, you know. Now, now, when you're in a movie, right? Because like I said, you've been in so many. I'm sure you've been in some movies. Once again, you don't have to say which ones. Where you played against an actor that you could tell isn't selling it. Does it mm -hmm. make it hard for you to buy into your character when you're playing against someone who doesn't look like they bought into theirs? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And conversely, if you're playing, if you're doing a scene like with James Spader in the Blacklist, or, or I, did, I did a film with Karen Allen, who's a terrific actress. If you're doing a scene opposite someone who's, you know, or Shawshank opposite, you know, Morgan Freeman, it's the thing just lifts off the page. There's no, it's like a mm -hmm. tennis match between two people who can really play. And, um, and if you're working against, if you're working with someone who's not, you know, not giving you what you, <laughs> not not as not very good or, yeah. or struggling struggling with it um you still have to find you still have to find a way in you still have to find a way to make what your engagement with this person um mm. believable so um it's just more challenging yeah you do okay well, of course you work with people of all different you know, you work with someone on a TV show who's been on the show for 150 years and they just could, they're, they're calling it in, yeah. you know, they're just, um, can't, can't be bothered to get it up anymore. Um, <laughs> and you somehow, you somehow have to, uh, keep your own fire burning, you know, mm. don't, you don't, don't let them. You know, don't let them uh, drag you drag you into that <laughs> vortex. Of, <laughs> I don't really I don't really want to be here. I'm already shopping for shoes somewhere else. You know. I'm, uh, oh, look at the time. So yeah. anyway, I, I mean, yeah, you are such a, a great actor, and I'm not just throwing shit. You are a fantastic actor, and when you play a villain, you play a villain Die Hard two and some other ones as well. Do you find that you do such a good job that people are actually afraid of you on set a little bit? Like, does, does it carry the fear of you as an actor, <laughs> the character in the movie? Does it kind of carry over off set a little bit? Where people are like, oh, it's shit, it's a little scared to approach you? I think it, yeah, I think that when I, well, when I first meet people on the set, there's, there, there's sometimes, uh, um, they're sometimes intimidated 
uh, maybe because I've been in a lot of stuff and maybe because they, you know, they've seen me play such, you know, hard asses. Um, but I, part, part of my job too is to let them know, is to, you know, um, get on the same page with them. Mm. They, 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 they mustn't be afraid to uh, throw stuff at me or, you know, we have to engage with one another. So we have to get, we have to find a way to get past that quickly. Mm. And um, 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 off the set, people used to, yeah, there were a lot of people who were surprised that I'm a nice person. Um, if, if all you've ever seen is the guy from Die Hard 2 or something, <laughs> um, or Hard to Kill, uh, you know, they're like, they, 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 I don't know what they expect, but, but they're often surprised. Yeah. I mean, lucky to talk to you three times. It's my third time talking to you. And, I've, and I will say the first time I spoke to you, I must say, I was kind of expecting kind of this tough guy to be like, oh man, this is going to be a rough <laughs> interview. I'll try to get on my game because this guy is going to chew me up if I'm not careful. <laughs> You're like the nicest guy I've ever met. So like, you know, it's yeah. funny watching Guy R2 thinking, when, when, or when you're like a villain or um, in a whole like that, I'm watching him like, he's not, he's not scary. He's a real nice guy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, that's the, that's the gig. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm, you know, and it's, um, it's, it, that's the, it, that's the job. And, the, and you have to, you know, you have to, you get a script, you have to identify not just who you, who this guy is and what he, you know, what he does and what he wants and his relationship to all these other people. You also have to, you also have to find out what he's, what's his job in the film, mm. in the story, in the big story arc. Is he the, is he the one that at the end you're surprised to find out that he's a nice guy, you know? So in which case you want to lean into what a badass he is, uh, you know, you, you, uh, yeah, you sort of get, you have to gauge what it is that, that the, that the film wants mm. from, from this character. What's the, what's this character's function in the story? Mm. You know, is he the red herring or is he, the, or is he the nice guy who at the end I, I auditioned for and then turned down when I got the job, the, uh, the murderer in, uh, the bone collector. Oh, wow. Um, it's another loving, sweet guy. Um, and the, and the trick with him would have been, that you see him, um, you meet him, you meet that character a couple of times in the movie before you find out that who he is, that, that he cuts people up and he's, you know, he's this, uh, monster. And the tr and the trick with me would be would have it would have been I didn't uh, I ended up turning the film down but but it would have been to throw the audience off mm. to um, make him so likable that you you that you'd never expect that that was going to come from him um, which is kind of hard because I have a, people come to movies with a backlog of Oh no, he was the guy in this and he was the you know what I mean? Mm. The second you the second you would have seen me deliver pizza <laughs> in the beginning of the movie, that it would be hard for people not to go, dude, I, <laughs> did you see who's delivering the pizza? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. But that but, but that's that's what I mean though. Um you have to you you not only have to figure out what it is you're going to do, with, uh, you know, the key character you're going to create. Well, like the like the Grim Reaper, he's he's terrifying in the beginning. The first time you meet him in Bogus Journey, mm. he's this figure that he should scare the crap out of you. Um, and he does, and he scares the crap out of them until they engage him in the games. At which point he becomes this petulant spoiled mm. sore loser weasel you know trying to weasel out of it and all of a sudden all of these other colors start coming up and he's not so dangerous he's just a dope like you know <laughs> um 
and he's got the and he's just got this really nice uh, arc throughout the movie um until finally he wants to be a part of the band he wants to be you know don't he <laughs> he um so yeah so that's that's anyway that's that's what i do with that was a long-winded way to say that's what i do when i see a script <laughs> no it was a, a great answer thank you so um you're gonna be in the upcoming salem's lot movie right now, i am now <laughs> now when you um chose salem lot uh first why did, why did you choose that film and second is that the first movie you've been in that's had previous versions interesting yeah i think it is the first movie i've been in that had previous ver previous versions um i'm and i i said yes to the project because i love stephen king mm. um i mean i've done i think it was that would be my fourth stephen king movie oh wow um and they're Phenomenal. They're so they're great fun to work with. He's a great, he's a fantastic writer. He creates characters that are uh, that have wonderful colors and human foibles and you know cowardice when you need a hero and hero when you need cowardice and mm. um, they're just they're really they're really fun and and I was I was sort of the also because I'd been in through three other Stephen King movies, I was sort of the, um, they call it an Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my character was sort of an Easter egg. My, the fact that I was in it because I was, oh, he was in the mist and he was in the green mile and he was in Shawshank and, and they, there are little nods to those uh, lots of other Stephen King movies throughout but it was great, you know, fantastic uh, cast and director. I thought it was, uh, I thought it had a chance to be a really terrific film. I like the David Sewell one from years ago. Mm. Um, maybe it was just time to, you know, try it again. All right. So when you're playing in a movie like Salem's Lot, and obviously, yes. like I said, this movie has been, Actually, it's had two versions. There's a miniseries that came out a couple of years ago, and then there's another one from the right. 1979. Um, so obviously, it's been played before. Uh, the parts been played before. How do you approach a character that you know has prior versions? Do you try to block it out completely? Do you look at it for inspiration? You, <laughs> that's a well, that's a tough one. I mean, if you if you're, um, you know, if you're if you were cast as Stanley Kowalski in Streetcar. You you can't ignore the fact you know that Brando did it before. It's like it's like uh, you have a you have a real hurdle to get over. Mm. But in this case, because um, I I didn't pay too much attention to what had what had been done before. I thought I thought maybe it was it would be better if we created our own world with our own relationships and our own you know the fabric of this universe is is just this universe hmm. and um and don't pay too much attention to who's who's played what or how they did it um that's i don't i don't find it i don't usually find it helpful to um hmm. cuz i can get i can get intimidated if it's <laughs> been played by someone wonderful um I can say, oh crap! Now what do I do? He did all the good stuff. <laughs> is it? Do you find it is it riskier to play a part that's been done before, or is there a confidence knowing the movie itself, at least the plot, has been embraced by audiences once before? I, th I think in this in this particular case, I think the story is so strong. Mm. Um, it's a great no It's a great Stephen King novel. Mm. And I think the the elements of the story are so compelling, are so strong that um, you 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 just have you have to play them. You can't. You have to play. You know, pay attention to the the, the actions. You know, what happens to your people? 
to th these people this time, and I'm and and it'll carry you through. It's in a, it's not to compare it to Shakespeare or anything, but Hamlet's been done mm -hmm. and done and done and done, you know, for hundreds of years. You you have to tend your own fire. You have to find your own voice in in these characters and and you know it's fun to look at what other people have done with you know, mm. um, but at the end of the day you have the more complete and compelling you can make your people the the, the better story you're going to tell so wait, listen, when you're playing the um the character that's been done um, are you able to make to hear your own voice in the character? Like, or like, do you like said so you don't ever and you never go back to take a look? You mean, um, well, when when, you, when you're like I said when you're playing a character like I said that um that has you said like I said has the prior um movies. Oh, like, that's been done before. Right, right. Do you are you able to make sure that you can hear your own voice in the character, and do you yeah. avoid going back at all? Because I know you said it before, so it's in your memory. Yeah, I. <laughs> yeah. I play. I, it's in your memory, but it's. Uh, but when they say action, you're, you know, you're pretty specifically focused on this, this thing, this time, this place. Mm. I don't. Uh, <clears throat> I try not to let uh, past performances confuse me, or inform what I'm doing, um, mm. because I'm. You can't be sure that anybody else has seen any. I mean. You, you know, this is a new audience, new generation, mm. new people. New people are going to see this who have never seen it before. And yours is going to be the one that they measure, you know. It's the only one that matters. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the only thing you have any control over as an actor is what happens between when they say action and when they say cut. You know, that 48 seconds or whatever it is, three minutes, that's the it's really the only thing you're responsible for, but it's also mm. the only thing you, you have a lot of control over. Um, now, having been so, an actor in so many horror films and having your reputation in some of these movies, are you able to, do you lean on that reputation when you do the performance? That you know, I, you can either back off because people, you know, already know people are going to look and go, he is the heart, he's scary because I've seen him in scary stuff before. Are you able to, or do you kind of go, you don't want to rely on you know what people might come in looking well sometimes you can sometimes it's good to lean on that stuff you can you know um because because people have a you know they uh, they have a history with my characters mm. they're you know they've seen they've seen me do things before and you you carry that stuff with you to the next movie that you see them in um so it's um yeah and that can work to your advantage you don't have to you know, I don't have to do very much at all to get people to think, um, oh shit, he's, uh, you know, he could, he, he could kill you and then sit on your chest and eat a sandwich. Um, <laughs> it's because they've seen, they, they, they have a history with that, with the actor, with mm. those other roles. And they, and you do bring that. So it'd be like, if you could cast, you know, James Gandolfini in something today as, oh, let's say a, let's say a hard ass cop. Yeah. Um, he, he wouldn't have to do much to get the audience to carry over the Sopranos character to, uh, you know, mm. I mean, Al Pacino does this a lot, you know, if you've seen him do it enough, um, you can just nod to it, and and the audience goes, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's would you so it's in aid more than it's baggage, you would say? Yes, I think so. Yeah. So um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say it's it's only baggage if you're trying if if um like I did a show called Wonderfalls. I, I had to prove to the casting people and the directors on that I could be funny because I had played all of these heavy killer monster characters. Um, you know, you, you then you have to prove to people that you can be a play a dad or be a you know play a kindergarten teacher or you know mm. 
or be funny. Um, you've always got to show people. It, it, well, at any point in your career, like I said, your career has been, obviously you've been extremely successful. You had such a long career. Was there ever a point that you got afraid of typecasting that it could happen to you? I was, I was worried at first when I first got to Los Angeles and, and, and it was the, the heavy and Project X and then the heavy, I was the heavy and in, in uh, the hot spot and hard to kill and die hard too. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, you know, Hollywood is really good at slamming you into a little cubby hole and saying, well, he's good at that. I would, I don't want to see him do Shakespeare. I don't want to see him do anything else. Mm. And uh, um, I was, I was worried about it until Bill and Ted came along and then, <laughs> and then I was successfully funny in a movie and that kind of, and I, I don't know, that just threw a wrench into the bad guys. Then it was like, well, how can we take him seriously as a bad guy? If he's, <laughs> <laughs> we've seen him we've seen him be so goofy mm. um but uh, no i don't worry about it anymore so um salem's lot is directed by gary doberman i believe is how you pronounce the last name mm -hmm. uh, um who has also has a wonderful horror pedigree for movies like the nun so what kind of insights to the genre of horror did he bring and how did he was he to work with and did he have insights into how you could perform in the horror movie that might have been different than another director who didn't have the pedigree. Um, Gary, Gary was great to work with, but um, he's <laughs> he he did the thing that I like the most with directors, which was first they see what they tr they trust the actor that they cast, and they and they first take a take a good look take a good look at what I think of the character, where I think he should go. And then tweak, you know, mm. make them make the character a little funnier, or make the you know make this moment make this moment lighter, or make this. Um, he do, he's a he's a terrific director in that in that regard, and um, in that in that you feel like you you know you come away feeling very confident about what you're doing, and if he needs a, if he needs to nudge it one way or the other, nudge. You know, he mm. does it. He does it in that great way. It's like, it's like you finish the scene and and he leans over and says, uh, you know, uh, he's lying to you. He's lying to you. Um, let's do it again, and we go again with that note. You know, yeah. and it's like it's a, it's almost as if you drop a little bit of ink in the water, and it just goes. It goes everywhere, and it colors. It colors the whole scene without, without changing. You know, it doesn't change the basic shape of the scene, but it adds a color that wasn't there before. Mm. And uh, anyway, I I enjoyed working with him. I think that, um, and uh, he approached it. Uh, he approached it with his sensibility and his, you know his compass and and I'm, i agree sometimes i'll sit there and think why you know why is the director going in that direction um but with him it was i knew exactly where he was going we were so we were sort of on the same wavelength right along yeah so um a salem lot comes out is it later when, like, when is it supposed to come out do you know i don't know no, oh, fair enough. Uh, well, one other thing I found that was fascinating about you is that you actually have a music career. You're a music performer when you're not acting. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been well. I've played guitar and ukulele and banjo and mandolins mm -hmm. all my life since I was a little kid on the farm, and uh, and I've written songs all my life too. But when the pandemic hit and all the the industry was just put on hold mm -hmm. and everybody was, uh, you know, stuck in their homes. I started to focus on my songs and, uh, and I started to write new ones as well and, and share them around. And then, and I ended up, I have a kind of a producer 
I have a, a sound engineer who works with me. In fact, we were both just given Emmys for um, not the not the actual Emmy. Stephen Colbert got the actual Emmy. We got we got the uh, hey Emmy committee. You should you should let those you should give those guys some kind of a plaque too. <laughs> so me and Matthew Kulowitz, my sound engineer, both got this uh, Emmy. We were Emmy adjacent, I guess, for uh, the Cartoon President show. But anyway, he's been helping me, and I have another friend named Steve Kirkman who's been helping me. And and before I knew it, I had I had a you know a dozen or so songs. Um, I started sharing them. I started making these things called the kitchen tapes, where I would sit in my kitchen and play them and sing them and tell stories about movies. And you can go on YouTube and find the kitchen tapes. Um, and I think what I'm going to do with because I don't know how you release a song or an album these days. Mm. But I think what I'm going to do now is uh, we're getting ready to go into a studio at Master Disc in, in Peekskill, New York, and um, with a little group and perform these and tape them and put those out oh, very like cool. with better sound and better editing and, you know, um, also probably on the kitchen tapes. And I think that's, I think that's how they're going to be released. And then maybe out to a streaming service or something so people can, mm. or maybe I'll have vinyl printed up. I, I can't believe we still, they still do vinyl. Uh, everything was vinyl when I was for half of my life. Um, but I guess people do vinyl and, uh, you know, maybe I'll have a bunch of those printed up and then sell them through a website or something. And mm. I'm thinking of having the proceeds go to Doctors Without Borders or something. Oh, wow. Not, not, not make it a, you know, I'm not looking to have uh, a second career um, as a singer, songwriter. But I think the songs are fun and worthwhile. And, uh, you know... <laughs> I have this, I have this nightmare in the back of my head of, uh, of, um, like William Shatner oh. smoking a smoking a cigarette and doing a uh, Rocket Man. Oh, Rocket Man! Uh, yeah, it, 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 it isn't as great as that was. It isn't that. Okay, these are these are authentic songs that I that I actually wrote, and I hope people like them. So. <laughs> so, so, so back when you were a kid, you were in um, a band called the Night Riders. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Is, is the music you're writing now um, in the similar genre as you did when you were in the Night Riders? No, when I was in the Night Riders, we only we just did covers of um, Stone songs and uh, the Birds, and um, you know, we did uh, Gloria. G L O R I A G L O W N D E N D E N D E anything with three chords we could we just nailed. Um, <laughs> we had long hair and we had tight pants and we <laughs> actually rehearsed in a garage in my garage in Buffalo, um, and we won the battle of the bands. It was uh, you know under my thumb a girl. Who wants put me down? We were, I guess the band was, uh, it was great, great fun. It was great, great fun. And we were kind of popular in high school. You know, we played, we played dances around high school and fire halls and things like that. Mm. We won the Battle of the Bands. That's so cool. But, not, but that was 1965, 66, 67, you know. And I was in a folk group before that. And then, uh, yeah, and then I was in the kegs and then I was in the night riders. And uh, then I discovered acting. But, um, and one of the reasons that the band, you know, that, that the band, so I sort of set the band aside was I went off, I discovered acting and there was a, there was a lot to learn there. Mm. Um, um, but, but also I didn't just want to do covers. I didn't want to, 
Um, you know, the, the fun, the, the really exciting part would be to write something, you know, create the harmonies, create the song and put that out there. Mm. You know? um, I mean, as fun as it is to do, but what was it? The Standells who did down by the river, down the banks of the river, Charles, bom, 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 bom. that's where you'll find me. Along with lovers, muggers, and thieves. Bum, 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 bum. Love that dirty water. Yeah, we, we killed that song. And GLOR and Gloria and Louis Louis. Like I said, three chords. They're all, they're all three chords. <laughs> <laughs> but we realized them. So, uh, oh, and, oh, and the other one we did was. Uh, 96 tier, that's like two chords. Boom. I'm gonna cry. 96 tears. Oh, cry, 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 cry. Anyways, there you go. That's that's my life in a nutshell. <laughs> so so when you're um so now when you're writing your music, where are as a as question may be, like where is the music coming from? Are you are the like are, are you thinking of a particular genre or is the words coming to you and then you built it around a genre, a uh, followed genre music or a sound around it? They're 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 from various, but I guess they're a lot of it may sound kind of like urban folk, um, singer songwriter stuff, you know, kind of Paul early Paul Simon or James Taylor or you know that in that in that world some of them are old. i have a couple of them that are like old rockabilly uh i don't know one called 29 cups of coffee that uh kicks ass but it sounds like but it deliberately sounds like an old elvis number you know very retro um and yeah it's whatever suit whatever whatever suits the the story of the song if the, you know, and, and some of them are just are kind of sweet romantic things. Some of them are down. I guess a lot of them kind of live in the Randy Newman, um, Leon Redbone. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, there a, a lot of old school. Um, I draw from a lot of old school influences for these things. A lot of them are funny because um, I. You know, I'll get some silly idea in my head and write and write the song down that road. Mm. So I'm 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 excited to see how people react to this. If they're, you know, if I'm, I've had good responses among the few people that have listened to them so far, but I sort of can't wait to. I'll let you know when. Uh, I'll let you know when it's <laughs> when we're about to break loose. That that'd be awesome. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would be happy to. So, have you performed in front of an audience yet? Uh, the the new stuff, not obviously when you're being obviously you did that. But now, have you performed the new music in front of an audience? I have. I used to do uh, um, before the well before the pandemic. Anyway, I was I was getting up at the uh, um, I was singing at the Town Crier Cafe in um, Beacon, New York. They have a big stage and he kept inviting me back to do, you know, bigger and bigger shows of my songs, just me and the guitar. And I'm a okay guitar player, but it's really more fun if I get a couple guys behind me, um, you know, to fill it up, fill out the sound. Mm. Um, and then the, you know, and then the pandemic hit and it kind of shot that in the head. Mm. So I'm looking forward to doing these videos of, um, in a studio where the sound is good. You know, where we have complete control over the, the miking and the sound and so on. Mm. I think that'll be cool. So, uh, obviously, as an actor, you're used to performing in front of people. Did you mm -hmm. find because the music is yours and the lyrics are yours, do you feel more exposed performing your music or even when you're acting? When I'm doing the music. Doing the music? Yeah. Well, it's... it's I have I have a lot of confidence as an actor. I've you can you can throw almost anything at me, and I'm pretty sure I can, you know, I can figure I can find my way through it. 
uh, um, I have less experience sing, getting up and singing my own songs mm. um, and trusting that people will enjoy them and um, the stories that they that the songs tell will be interesting. Um, but that's but it's but it's just practice. I'm I'm getting better and better at that um, all the time. But yeah, you feel much more exp- <laughs> you feel much more exposed when it's. You know, they don't know you as a singer. They, mm. They've never heard these songs before. Um, you're a you're a pretty good guitar player, but you know, it's you know, it's not Dave uh, Mason, it's uh, or John Mayer. So I can't, you know what I mean. I can't lean back on those things. Mm. But what? But the package that you get with me, is a, you know. It has its own flavor. Once again, as we talked earlier as an actor, the idea of phoning things in or finding their, your mood for a particular character or your place. When you're singing a song, um, it, it, once again, it's your lyrics, but you don't always necessarily are in that headspace at that moment when you're singing the song. Is your acting then taken over when you're performing? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I find... Uh, um, I I find that uh, I write when I write songs. I imagine a character saying these things to his girlfriend or to the world, or um, and it's and and I also find myself falling into the characters that are that are talking. You know, so, um, so when can our listeners expect to maybe hear some of your music? <laughs> Here's some of the exciting um, music that we're creating. Um, I would think in a month or so, we're going to, they're mastering the the recordings now. And, um, and we're working out the details of the, uh, of these uh, video, um, these videos that we're going to make. I guess there's something along the lines of the tiny desk series that NPR does, you know, Mm. Um, they, they, they may feel a bit like that, although it's a nicer studio. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. So, so I'm when, looking forward to it. when they're ready to be released, please let me know. We'll add it to the, um, video, yeah. the audio, so people will know where to find it. So Mr. Sadler, absolutely. absolute pleasure to talk with you. I, I know you're busy, so I'll make sure I let you go. But, um, Thank once you. again, third time the charm, always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.